Processes session one, part two. We're going to look at a short introduction to the different materials that we're going to work with and most, most specifically jointing copper pipes. So our objectives for this part of the session are for you guys to be able to state the requirements uh, for fittings used for hot and cold water supplies, no matter what material, and um, describe the differences between the different grades of copper and state the most commonly used pipe sizes, as well as the most commonly used grade of copper as well. I also want you guys to be able to recognise each of the fittings used to joint copper and describe the jointing process. So we use lots of different types of pipe materials uh, as plumbers. Some are used for water delivery, some are used for heating pipe work, some for gas and some for removing the wastewater. And some of the ones that we're going to come across are copper. We use copper probably more often than most, most things apart from perhaps plastic. Stainless steel, very occasionally might, might use this. Low carbon steel, cast iron, lead, we're not going to fit that from you. We might kind of have to connect onto it though. And plastic. And there's a couple of different sort of categories of plastic. We, we have plastic pipe, which we use for water supply. Uh, and we have plastic pipe that we use for water drainage. All pipes and fittings that are used on wholesome water supplies must comply with the Water Materials and Fittings Directory, um, which is written by RAS, Water Regulations Advisory Scheme. And basically this sets out that the, the fittings and paper must not corrode or otherwise contaminate the water supply. And it's a legal requirement to use fittings that, that form this directory that meet this standard. Okay, copper. Copper is a general purpose pipe used for water delivery. There's four different grades of copper. Um, sorry, there's three different grades of copper. Some people call them tables of copper. Uh, and these are R220, R250 and R290. We can use each of them for hot, cold and heating, though R250 is the most commonly used type. Okay. Look at the characteristics of each of these uh, now. So R220, R220 is copper that's been annealed, it's been heat treated to make it softer. Uh, in the past, they used to use it underground for the supply of water, though you'll find it more often uh, used for heating pipe work now. Um, instead of using our R220 under the ground now, they more often not, not, not use MDP, which is a type of plastic pipe. So if we do come across RT20, it's probably going to be small bore, 8mm, 10mm pipe work, which is, is going to be used for, for heating. Technically micro bore. Okay. So RT20 has been fully annealed. It's been heat treated, which makes it soft. Okay. Uh, you can get RT20 up to size 22, though you're most likely going to come across it or use it as a plumber in, in 8mm or 10mm. You might occasionally use it in, in 6mm as gas pipes, uh, for example. R250. R250 is a most commonly used type. Um, and the sizes can vary from 12mm up to 54mm. So the, the sizes that we are most likely to use are 15mm, 22mm and 28mm. So it's worth it making sure we remember these. Okay. R250 can be plated with chromium, gives it a nice, nice, pretty, kind of shiny finished look. R250 is, is considered to be half hard. Um, so it's quite rigid and you can only, you should only really bend it using a bending machine or very occasionally, uh, if it's a smaller bore, uh, R250 pipe, you could bend it using a bending spring. R290, known as hard copper pipe. This is actually going to be treated to make it hard. Um, the walls are generally going to be a little bit thinner, but the outer bore, the external bore, is going to be the same um, as it would be if it was R250, uh, which would be so if the common pipe size is again going to be 15mm, 22mm, 28mm. 
Okay. Uh, you can't bend R2, R290. It's not, not using the machine. Any changes of direction would have to be done with fittings. So we're going to look at the different uh, ways of jointing copper now. So there's lots of different ways of jointing copper. One is uh, through using end feed capillary solder and another is using an integral ring capillary solder. Very, very similar processes with just a subtle difference that we're going to look at uh, very soon. We could also uh, joint it with type A non-manipulative compression fittings or type B manipulative compression fittings. Again, they're both compression fittings. There, there's some similarities and we're going to look at the key differences very soon too. You could also use press fit fittings to joint it or push fit fittings. We're going to look at these now. Firstly, soldered fittings. So there's the two key sort of soldered fittings are end feed fittings and integral soldering fittings. The jointing process is almost exactly the same for both. When you solder fittings, you firstly clean up the pipe with, a, with an abrasive cloth or a piece of steel wool. You should also clean the inside of the fitting and then put some flux onto the end of the pipe only. Don't put it into the fitting because if you then push the flux inside the fitting, you end up with a buildup of flux inside the fitting. It's not, not good. OK, um, you don't want too much flux inside the system, so just put the flux on the clean end of the pipe and then and push that into the into the clean fitting. Clean off any excess flux so it's not running down the pipe and then heat the fit, fitting up using a blowtorch. Um, if it's an end feed fitting, you'd need to add solder to it, like you can see in this picture here. If it's an integral solder ring fitting, you would just heat it until you see that band of solder sort of drop out um, of the, the solder that's already been integrated into the into the fitting already. OK, after you've finished, make sure you give it a wipe um, to remove any excess flux. Uh, the flux is there to essentially to stop the pipe from oxidising during the process, which allows the, the solder to be pulled in and, and stick stick then to the surface. Um, but the flux is corrosive, so if you leave it on the pipe for a long period, it can cause cause corrosion. When you do solder, obviously makes make extra sure that you don't say, catch anything with your blowtorch because there's is a risk of fire. There's a further risk, especially if you're working in confined spaces, uh, from fumes from the combust uh, from the process combustion process and to a lesser degree from the flux, which can irritate your lungs. So end feed fittings, as we've just mentioned, they, you'd be jointed using the process that we've just looked at, but you'd need to add solder to them. And our integral solder ring, as you can see in a picture on the left hand side here, they've got a ring of solder integrated them in, into them already. You can sort of see um, with a sort of raised raised bit here where, where the solder has been integrated and with, with the integral soldering fittings you clean up the pipe clean up the fitting put the flux on add heat and then the solder would, would, would sort of come out when it reaches the, the melting melting point okay press fit fittings excuse me a slightly more recent introduction to plumber, plumbing they have a rubber o-ring inside there um, they do kind of look a, a little bit like our integral soldering fittings you can see here, but you can with these you can see a rubber o-ring there instead of a, a, a solder ring essentially. And what happens is you get a crimping machine which would crimp the rubber o-ring tightly onto the the fitting, squashes it onto the fitting, and that's what keeps the keeps it sealed. And that's um, a heat free method of jointing. So some sites they don't allow hot works, which is like working with blow torches. And, and in that case, you, we might use press fit fittings. Push fit fittings, going to briefly look at as well. It's another um, fitting that doesn't require heat to, to, to create the joint. 
you can see a few examples of, of press fit fittings. They, they can look very, very different. But in general, they all kind of work the same way. They've got a rubber O-ring inside them. They'd have a, a sort of grab ring, like you can see on this middle one up here, with the sort of teeth pointing backwards. And then that, that way, once you've pushed the pipe in, those teeth essentially stop the pipe from being pulled out. And the, and the rubber O-ring will, will help keep it watertight, essentially. Um, so, yeah, that's how push fit fittings work. There's various ways of removing them depending on the on the material, essentially. So you can see the, the sort of grab ring just here in this picture as well. OK. Easy to fit, fairly easy to remove, generally speaking. A uh, good thing about push fit fittings is you can actually use them to joint copper and joint plastic. So you can, if you need to make a connection between copper to plastic, use a push fit fitting. Or we could also potentially use compression fittings, which we're going to look at uh, now. OK, so, yeah, the type A compression fittings, these are the ones that you, you guys are using the, in the workshop. And um, they've got an olive inside them. And the olive is, is what kind of grabs onto the pipe, what holds the pipe and also keeps it watertight. Um, it's shown here as a compression ring, but the proper name for it is an, is an olive. OK. Um, yeah. And. This is a type A compression fitting, known as non-manipulative compression fitting. So all you need to do with this is you need to cut the pipe, deburr it, put the pipe into the fitting, and then tighten up the nut on the fitting, uh, which compresses the olive onto the pipe, which, which stops the pipe from slipping out and creates a watertight seal. Much easier to, to fit than the type B compressions, which we're going to look at in a second. Okay. A uh, couple of key things to remember though, okay, don't over compress it. If you over compress it, you could end up squashing the pipe, which means that the, the system will leak and you'll also restrict the flow. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I said, you can use them to, to joint to, to plastic as well. So you, you can joint copper to plastic using our type A compression fittings as well as our push fit fittings. Okay. Type B compression fittings, also known as manipulative compression fittings. Um, good way to remember it is you can see that the end has been manipulated. The end has to be changed for a manipulative compression fitting. Okay. Another key thing worth remembering, right? A type A compression fitting, we can only use above ground. So A for above ground. Type B compression fitting, we can use for both. We can use it for above ground and below ground. So that's another key thing worth remembering. Type B compression fitting is the only type of compression fitting that we can use underground. OK. And the reason that we can use underground is because it's much more difficult, much less likely for it to pop out of, of the fitting because of its flare, flared end. <coughs> Excuse me. OK. Here's another picture of one here. And you can you can see that they you put the nut and the compensating ring over the pipe. We then use a swaging tool to, to flare out the end of the pipe before putting the adapter into the end of the pipe and, and tightening it tightening it up as you would a, a regular compression fitting. Okay. Uh, manipulative, like I've said, <coughs> manipulative fittings can be used above ground, but they can also be used below ground, which type or type A cannot. OK, though, like I've said already, we would use a blue MDPE pipe underground more often than not these days. OK. So whatever type of fitting you use, we've got general names that apply to all of them, depending on their shape. So elbows, these can be 90 degree elbows or 45 degree elbows. And also, so if sometimes if they've got a spigot on them, they can be known as M and F elbows or or, or street elbows. Um, M and F stands for sort of male and female. So you've got the, the sort of male spigot there and the female side just here. OK. Uh, straight couplings. Um, yeah, we can see them just here. There's a variety of them. They're, they're all sort of fairly straightforward to, to recognise. Uh, cap ends and stop ends again sort of fairly straightforward to recognize they all do the same the same thing 
correct names for tees that they would vary depending on on their size. Uh, if all parts of the tee are the same size, it'd be an equal tee. So all of the parts uh, were 15 mil, then you call it a 15 mil equal tee. All of the parts were 22 mil, you you call it a 22 mil equal tee. If some of the, the the parts are different sizes than the other, we'd always talk about the middle part, the central part of the tee, as the last uh, last thing we'd sort of say. So this one we've got two ends of 28 mil, the middle's 15 mil, so we call it a 28, 28, 15 T. Okay, 28, 28, 15 end feed T in this case. Okay, uh, and then this one, we've got the two ends are 22 mil, the middle part's 35. So this one's a 22, 22, 35 end feed T. Okay, all straightforward enough. A couple other key bits to look at. This is a flexible tap connector. Uh, this is a, a bent tap connector. Uh, with, with a fibre washer there, you can see that's what keeps it watertight. Got a straight tap connector, compression um, example here. Passover, then just here. A reducer, just here, infield reducer. This is a manifold. Any Anything that you use to connect several pipes, um, several smaller pipes to, to one larger pipe would be known as a manifold, and it's a manifold, yeah. That's one worth remembering because it might come up in a couple of exams. Okay, and finally, this one here is a tank connector, a tank connector with a rubber washer there. Okay, if we were connecting to lead, uh, we might use a sort of kind of a fancy compression fitting. Um, City guilds might call it a proprietary fitting. Um, they might call it a lead block, which is most what most plumbers would call a lead block for connecting to lead. But it's, it's basically a compression fitting. Okay, it's got a rubber o-ring in there and a grab ring, uh, which would be compressed and grip onto the pipe and keep it all watertight. Very one last thing, looking at pipe sizes, this is a key thing to remember. It will come up in several tests, so make sure we commit these to memory. Um, and th these are key key sizes here. Really, we've got 15 mil for for copper. 15 mil, the horizontal maximum distance between clips should be 1.2 metres. Vertically, it should be 1.8. 22 mil and 28 mil are actually the same. Okay, 22 mil horizontally should be clipped every 1.8 at, at the absolute most. Vertically, 2.4. And like I say, 28 mil is just the same, 1.8, 2.4. Com commit these to memory, okay? It will be really worth your while, okay? And now it is time for your task.